everybody for joining us today. We'll uh, get started here in just a few minutes. Uh, we'll let folks uh, join us. Well, you guys are having an awesome Thursday, wherever in the world you happen to be. So the format today, we're going to cover, um, I've got Rob on the line, he's gonna cover on um, React Spectrum, um, and then we'll do that uh, 20, 30 minute um, presentation, and then we'll go into, uh, where you'll get an opportunity to ask questions. Um, a number of folks, um, thank you for the, the people who have pre-submitted questions, because um, that gave us a little bit to work with. So we've got some pre-submitted questions, which we'll go over, um, and uh, we'll certainly open it up for, for anything else, the, the second half hour here. All right, looks like we've got more folks joining, which is awesome. All right, Rob, how are you doing today? Doing pretty good, how about you? Excellent, eh, not too bad, not too bad at all. Um, yeah, so let's uh, kick it off. Um, so I wanna introduce Rob Snow. Um, he is uh, an engineer. Um, actually, what, what team are you on, Rob? I, I honestly don't know. I mean, there's- I'm on the React there's Spectrum team. <laughs> Okay, the React Spectrum, that makes sense. Um, so yeah, um, and you're going to tell us all about React Spectrum, what it is and how it relates to Firefly and, um, show some, some stuff we can do with it. So take it away, Rob. All right. All right. Uh, today we are going to talk a little bit about React Spectrum, uh, which is an implementation of Adobe's design system called Spectrum. Uh, we'll cover what Spectrum, what React Spectrum has to offer and how to get started with it in your Firefly apps. Uh, so quick little note about me, I'm Rob. I'm from the React Spectrum team, as I just said. Uh, I joined as a contributor, actually, um, to our internal predecessor several years ago. Um, and before we dive into React Spectrum, let's actually start with a quick intro to Spectrum, which is Adobe's design system. Uh, so. As I said, React Spectrum is a React implementation of Adobe's design system. And Spectrum is a set of guidelines, uh, patterns, and designs that all applications in Adobe should be based on. Uh, the goals of Spectrum are to unify our products, um, giving our users a cohesive design and a consistent and inclusive user experience. And design systems are more than just styles, as the name would suggest. They are a complete system. And so what does that mean? Uh, we can really kind of think of Spectrum as kind of uh, got, got two parts, uh, the components and the patterns. And the components are complete with defined behaviors and interactions. Uh, they can range from something like a button uh, to form elements to modals, pickers, menus. Uh, and these used together create a pattern or an application. And the ones shown here are a few already included in uh, Spectrum and React Spectrum. Uh, patterns are the other aspect of Spectrum, and you want a design system that allows for creative flexibility uh, while keeping the core of the design consistent. And to achieve this, Spectrum provides some guides on common patterns used in our products, such as cards, uh, tables, dialogues, and layouts. Uh, essentially, you can think of it as it's not enough to say here is a button. Um, you also want to be able to find the button in a, re in a reliable place uh, and with meaningful context. And these patterns are constantly being added to as the design system grows organically. So now that we've covered some basics of the design system, let's take a look at our library. Uh, React Spectrum aims to achieve a number of goals. Um, first, accessible um, from the get-go. More often than not, accessibility hey, is- Hey, Rob. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Are you sharing a deck? Because I can't see it in my oh. screen, but it, it very well yep. could just be me. But um... Sure. Let's see what happened here. I was trying to get my monitor um, screen set up. 
thought I hit the share button, but now I cannot find it. There it is again. Okay. Oh, I see what happened. Okay, sorry. One moment. <laughs> okay, no worries. We will all do some meditation while we're waiting. <laughs> you the meditative mo voice okay. in your music. Uh, there we go. Yep. Okay, sorry about that. Um, no worries. Yeah, I'll just back up and kind of quickly gloss back over the uh, the slides that we missed so that you. So there's our, our very nice Spectrum logo. Um, <laughs> so these are the components that I was talking about. Um, you know, things like buttons, form elements, um, modals, pickers, menus. Um, and so these are some of the ones that, that Spectrum has. Um, and then these are kind of the patterns that I was talking about when I was saying cards, tables, dialogues. Um, and so these these are the patterns of spectrum. And there we are, we're all caught up. Okay. <laughs> um, so more often than not, uh, accessibility is not as comprehensive as it should be in many products. Um, the difference between just passing an accessibility linter and really delivering a quality experience for those who don't use our products the same way as perhaps I would uh, can be pretty significant. And so we've included accessibility in the API design from the beginning. Uh, it's an integral part to the way that each component works. Uh, we follow the Y ARIA patterns and with help from our accessibility team, uh, we also include full keyboard uh, support. And we have themes that give enough contrast uh, to text and components. Uh, React Spectrum is internationalized into over 30 languages. Um, Adobe products are used all over the world, and so it's important that we uh, support them. Um, we also include right-to-left support, which mirrors for UIs uh, for languages such as uh, Hebrew and Arabic, which are read from right to left. Um, and on top of that, we also support internationalized date and number formatting for different locales. Um, React Spectrum is also uh, designed responsibly, and uh, you know this is a, an important feature of any application. Uh, with so many different devices available, we need to make sure that our components uh, can adapt no matter what the platform is. And so we change based on things such as the device screen size, the input mode, uh, and the color mode. And so we, we support different scales depending on the interaction mode, um, mouse or touch, um, which we're able to figure out using media queries, media queries, um, and and um, so for touch devices, uh, you need to hit area around a uh, checkbox to be bigger because you're using your finger, and and that would be a tough thing to uh, to tap on otherwise. Um, whereas if you have a mouse or a stylus, um, you can you can use a smaller um, uh, component. Um, and as mentioned before, we cover interactions no matter how you use your components, um, so mouse, touch, uh, keyboard, and screen reader. And we've tried to normalize support across all of these as, as best we can. Um, we also support dark mode automatically. And it's pretty common nowadays to see applications offering a dark mode. Um, even the operating system has a dark mode. Um, and we're able to support this based on both the user's OS settings uh, and at the application level. Um, React Spectrum also set out to be uh, customizable. And so while Spectrum is very specific with its styles, um, we still wanted to be able to give everyone the ability to change what they need for their own designs. A um, little bit more flexibility for those outside of Adobe. <laughs> um, we also um, allow for custom themes on top of React Spectrum, but if you really, really need um, more flexibility, uh, you can use our lower level hooks in React ARIA to control how you render. And I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit later on in the uh, presentation. So uh, we test on a lot of different devices, uh, phones, tablets, desktops, as well as different combinations of input methods like touch and trackpad. 
Uh, we've actually found a number of edge cases, especially on devices with multiple input methods uh, like the iPad and some Windows tablets and laptops, uh, which might have both a um, touch and a mouse. Uh, we also do visual regression testing and unit testing. And so the main takeaway that I want you to have from this very, very busy slide um, is that we test a lot. And uh, in addition to that, our components are being dog fooded as well. So you're using the same components uh, that Adobe uses to build their production applications. So cool features. Let's, uh, let's see what some of these mean in practice. I mentioned dark mode support, and we supply some default themes for React Spectrum. Uh, they handle the default dark and light color themes, and you can specify uh, which color theme you want in your app and uh, say you only want light. Um, but if you want your uh, application to support changing color, um, based on the operating system user preferences, this is automatically supported. Um, is it playing? Oh, good. Um, if your computer is set to dark mode, our components will appear in a dark color theme. Um, if your mobile device is set to dark mode, the same thing will happen. And if your customers change their system preferences halfway through their ses session, uh, our components will pick up these changes via media query, which will trigger the color change that you are seeing here. Um, sorry, my voice is getting a little gravelly. 20 minutes is... Um, a long time to talk after not talking much at all during COVID. All right, <clears throat> menus. Um, we've worked really hard to make sure that our components behave in expected ways across different devices and platforms. Um, for example, popovers are not typically a great experience on mobile devices. Um, you know, you might kind of fat finger away from them or, or not be able to scroll them very easily. Uh, so when you create a popover in your application and a user views it on a touch device, uh, we'll detect this and we'll render your popover uh, content as a modal instead. Um, another example is uh, menus. Typically menus appear as trays on mobile and touch devices. Um, and this is because of screen size restrictions and uh, again, that, that greater touch hit area. Um, our menu component will automatically swap between a popover menu and a tray, uh, depending on the available screen size. And so you can see that here. Uh, this is actually the same React Spectrum component um, menu. And when it's open um, in each of these contexts, it renders a different view. Um, Tooltips are another component that are uh, visually pretty simple. Um, Spectrum has guidelines for tooltips that follow a very similar pattern to native tooltips, and we actually follow um, the YRE specs as well. Um, and so you, you might notice that the uh, behavior for it is very similar to what you'd see using the title attribute in the browser. Um, there's a few intricacies of native tooltips, which uh, we we try to model after in, uh, after in React Spectrum. Um, for example, one tool tip at a time, um, a warm up and a cool down. Um, and as we can see here, there's a delay for the first, first tool tip, um, but there is no delay for sequential tool tips appearing um, unless you leave the, tool, the um, trigger for some period of time um, and then that resets. And uh, another, Thing to note is that uh, actually focusing on the target instantly brings up the tooltip for accessibility. Um, uh, breadcrumbs is an example of a component that follows a, a pretty specific spectrum behavior. Uh, breadcrumbs also have an ARIA pattern that we follow, but Spectrum has published guidelines on how breadcrumbs should look and behave in Adobe products. Uh, breadcrumbs have an overflow behavior where the breadcrumbs collapse into a drop-down menu, um, which you saw here. Um, and we can also see the breadcrumbs are shifting uh, in and out of that menu as the browser resizes. And this is all handled by React Spectrum. Um, and, and again, as the guides from Spectrum for how breadcrumbs should behave. Uh, dialogues are an example of um, the spectrum patterns that we talked about before. And so we needed to come up with a flexible API with some level of control. Uh, and we've accomplished this through CSS grids and a concept that we call slots. Uh, one of the challenges we had was to allow for enough 
content flexibility in the API while making sure that we could control the style of the content, uh, how Spectrum defines it. And so one advantage of this method is that we can shift the position of elements uh, when needed without using a lot of props or having the user implement uh, different code for different views. And so what, it, what does that actually mean? Um, in this video, you can see a full screen dialogue, but notice how we shift the position of the buttons in the top right and move them to the bottom when the space is limited. Uh, the header content also shifts to be under a smaller title. And so using slots allows us to specify where content should be positioned and styled in different scenarios without any effort on the user part. Um, so essentially what you're seeing here is the exact same DOM, um, but as the screen size changes, um, the reflow rules change based off of a CSS grid. Um, so now React Spectrum and Firefly. The uh, Firefly project template ships with uh, React Spectrum built in, uh, much to my delight. Um, so this reduces the work that you need to do. Um, I'm going to assume a basic knowledge of the Firefly getting started docs and call your attention to two pages in particular. Uh, the first is a quick blurb about React Spectrum that contains links to our documentation site. Um, I'll also be um, linking to it later on in this presentation as well. Uh, and then the second one is a page about your first client application. Uh, so when you follow the directions to initialize your application, you'll automatically be given a package JSON for your client. Um, in addition, the CLI will also run npm install. Um, and so as you can see here, um, when npm install is run, uh, the package Adobe React Spectrum, which is our, our um, big package that contains all of our components, uh, is automatically installed, and you get the latest minor version of our library. Um, in addition, several starter files will also be created to produce this te uh, template app. And so this is uh, shown in Firefly is getting started, so you won't miss it if you follow their documentation. Uh, it has our, our picker, our text fields, our button, um, and also you can see in the source code, uh, we can see that these are indeed React Spectrum components. Uh, I'm not showing you the import statements, so you're gonna have to take my word that they are. Uh, and Firefly isn't the only one calling attention to the ease in which you can match Adobe design. Uh, there's already several blog posts showcasing Firefly applications based on React Spectrum, uh, or rather based on Spectrum. Um, this is a demo app that NetCentric came up with. Um, again, you can recognize our buttons and our text fields. So React Spectrum makes building an Adobe themed application really easy. Um, but what if you are building something custom to your application? In that case, we have something called React Aria, which is a, a, basically a sub-library to React Spectrum. Um, it's, it's the topic of many other hour-long presentations, so I'll provide some links to those um, as well um, to our hosts. And these hooks are what, what actually drive React Spectrum. Uh, there's no rendering logic. These are all behavioral hooks. And as the name implies, it covers behaviors defined in the YARIA spec. And so now I'll quickly touch on some of these hooks. Um, so starting off kind of at a, a basic level, um, use checkbox. Uh, maybe you have something that behaves like a checkbox, but is visually distinct from the spectrum defined one because of your specific application. Uh, you could potentially use the use checkbox hook to provide all the ARIA um, and behavior and just provide the rendering logic. So we can see here that the label and input are completely under your rendering control. Um, all you have to do is spread the objects returned from our hooks on the appropriate element. Um, maybe you have some interactive components that should respond to a mouse click. Well, we've taken care of normalizing um, this to handle touch, keyboard, uh, voiceover interactions. Um, all you need to do is use press and you're covered for all the different interaction modes. So instead of on click and on touch and on key down, you just have one on press. Um, or maybe you want to handle focus rings the same way as we do in our components. Uh, so we have a component that will listen for focus and apply or remove uh, a specified focus ring class as needed. 
And so you can see that here being applied to a uh, styled native uh, button. So how to contribute? We are an open source project and we love contributions. If you see a component or a pattern that is on the Spectrum website that we haven't built yet or an ARIA behavior pattern that we don't have yet, uh, these are great candidates, candidates for our contribution. Also, if the uh, accessibility requirements seem daunting, uh, we're happy to work, work with contributors to work out API specs for the ARIA hooks and components, um, as well as defined behaviors. So we've, we've had a number of contributions from people who have only contributed, say, an ARIA hook, um, which is still a, a massive help. Um, we also have a great accessibility team, uh, and they'll help with the review process. And we also work closely with the Spectrum design team, uh, who is happy to help with any behavior or style concerns. So first, check out our documentation at uh, reactspectrum.adobe.com. We've put a ton of effort into this. Uh, there's lots of examples using the components in different situations. We show all the visual options that our components provide and lots of conceptual documentation as well about topics like styling, layout, testing, accessibility, uh, international uh, internationalization, and more. Uh, we also have documentation for each React ARIA hook on the website as well, uh, with examples of building custom components. And if you want to learn more about Spectrum Design, you can head over to spectrum.adobe.com. This is the website that our design team created, and it showcases all of the components as well, uh, but with a more design-oriented content. It tells you when you should use each component and variant, and when another might be more appropriate. And it documents the behaviors and anatomies of each component as well. And finally, we're open source, so you can check us out on GitHub under the Adobe org. Uh, we only open sourced a couple months ago, but the response has uh, already been pretty amazing. And we've gotten a bunch of contributions from outside Adobe, including some entirely new components. Uh, so if you're interested in contributing to an open source component library, we'd absolutely love to have you. And that's it. Thank you so much for listening. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, so I'm going to actually, well, I guess you stopped sharing, um, oh, which is sure. fine. I can go back. <laughs> well, what I was, I was going to say, um, if there's any questions, um, go ahead and put them into either the chat pod or the Q&A pod. Um, wherever, wherever you want to throw a chat uh, or sorry, a question up there, happy to answer it. Um, I was saying maybe you could continue sharing um, because maybe there was something that somebody if somebody had a question about um, your session. You can go back to the slide. Um, yeah, that was great. Um, so getting started with. Um, well, okay, look, I, I have a let, let me throw out another question before I throw that one out. Um, I'm guessing there's a there's a backlog or there's a number there's like a list of of things that you have that you want to build right that are not yet componentized that aren't yet not yet in there. Um, is there a list available someplace or I guess through the open source process is there a way to vote for like which ones you guys work on next or is there anything like what how do you manage priority I guess is what I'm getting at. Uh, yeah, um, priority is something that we are uh, still kind of working on a lot. Um, right now, the process typically is um, if if you want something that we're not currently working on, um, it is best to kind of talk to us about uh, what it is that you want and, uh, you know, work, work with us to come up with an API spec um, and then either can start on that um, yourself, or um, we can we can talk with you about priorities um, a little bit more directly. Um, so we don't we don't have a super formal approach to that yet, um, but it is something that we are working on. Um, as for kind of what's coming up, uh, we do have a wiki. I'm blanking on whether or not we have made that public. Um, mm -hmm. We do have. Um, within the GitHub project, we have a, a projects page, um, and that kind of shows what what the team is actually working on um, versus you know outside contributions. Okay, that's great. Uh, thanks very much for that, Rob. Um, 
Yeah, so I just wanted to mention for folks that are still on the call, I've got, I see there's a question, will the recording be available? Yep, we will make this available on our events page. Um, so you go to our Firefly page, um, and I'll have the link up here in a minute. Uh, there will be uh, an events section uh, under documentation. And that, that will actually, Rob, will you share your deck? That's a question for you. <laughs> yes, I'll, I'll send it to you after the um, okay. presentation. Okay, that's great. Then, yeah, we'll, we'll make that available as well. Um, okay, so let me, um, I can figure out how to share. Um, there we go. Okay, swap displays. Um, okay, so I'm hoping that people can see the screen. Um, my screen. Maybe. Yeah. I cannot. Okay. You <laughs> cannot. Maybe I need to stop sharing mine though. Uh, yeah, that could be. I don't think you were sharing. All no, good. I do not see your screen. <laughs> that is awesome. There we go. There we go. Come on. OK. Um, so uh, thanks again, Rob. Um, we're going to jump into uh, the questions that, that we've had. Um, and actually, there was there was one about can we use uh, before we jump to those, there's one about um, in the in the chat pod or the Q&A pod about can we use uh, this with AEM? Uh, this framework, and I'm I'm guessing the answer is yes, but I'll let you answer that, Rob, or Merrill, if you're you're on as well. To the best of my knowledge, um, I believe that um, that NetCentric app was actually an AEP demo. Yeah, so, uh, AEM. Right AEM, yeah. I can take that, guys. Uh, AEM UI itself. So I guess that Deepak would like to extend AEM UI without building a project Firefly app. So it's a bit out of context for uh, this presentation, of course. Uh, but to my knowledge, the AEM UI right now is not based on React specs. On, uh, on that's I'm mistaken. Sorry for that. We are not working for AEM as a product here. But uh, whatever the answer is, I would recommend you to use uh, what the framework. What framework is proposed out of the box by AEM to customize AEM? All right. Thanks, Meryl. Um, OK, so let's jump into um, some of the, the pre-questions. And actually, uh, Meryl, jump in. Unfortunately, I can't see. <laughs> I don't have enough screen, so I, I um, and unable to see the uh, the moderator screen when I'm sharing, um, which I could potentially stop sharing. But the what is React Spectrum? We just went through this, so um, this is just uh, this will be in the deck. Um, so a little blurb um, to kind of get you started. Uh, and then using React Spectrum with Adobe I/O, Rob covered this as well. And follow our guides um, to get started. Um, yeah, and you know whenever you create a default um, when you get a, a, a project or a, a using the template, create a Firefly app. Uh, it's going to create um, some code for uh, React Spectrum, so you can leverage that, modify it, etc. Um, how to develop experience platform apps from scratch? Um, and we've got some getting started guides. Um, I don't know, Dwee is on the line as well as um, Beryl, I don't know if you guys want to want to answer these. And I just kind of put put our pre answers up here, just kind of for something for folks to look at. But uh, if you guys want to address this, yeah, so I, I just replied to Gorov, uh, who is asking uh, what's the long term roadmap and vision for uh, creating another design system like React Spectrum in comparison with uh, other frameworks which are part of AEM this time, especially the, the core components and the React components. Uh, I think we are talking about two different things. React Spectrum is the framework that we use internally to build the uh, user experience for our product users. Like if you're going to a, to a specific UI, like a target UI or an analytics UI and so on, this is 
And on the other hand, the, the, the core components provided by AEM are used and aim to be used to build custom experiences for your customers and their consumers. Purpose is completely different. The goal way we are using React Spectrum within Project Firefly is because the B2E applications that you can build uh, right now and deploy to the Experience Cloud Shell are meant for your organization users. In that sense, these are the same users than the one who are already using our products within your organization. It makes totally sense in this scenario to, to let them and let your developers build experiences for your employees that look like Adobe products. Product yeah, that's great. Thank you for that. Is there any more on the chat pod that uh, or the Q&A pod before we um, jump through these other ones? There there is a last one uh, from Gaurav, and I think that uh, Rob is also able to, to provide more insights. Uh, so React Spectrum is not purely designed for serverless apps. It's a great fit within Project Firefly for the reasons I mentioned, and also because we are following Jamstack architecture, so uh, we simplify the architecture as most to have a speed development curve for apps. You focus on building APIs and deploy them to runtime, and then you have uh, the whole UI uh, built with React Spectrum as a, as a front-end framework. But React Spectrum, I said, is used also in other uh, deployments, type of deployments and architectures for Adobe products, which are not necessarily serverless. Rob, do you want to add something to that? Um, yeah, can you just repeat the question? Because I actually missed that part. The, the question was from Gaurav, and he wants to know if React Spectrum is purely designed for serverless apps and use cases, or if it could be used uh, within other use cases, like non-serverless oh. apps, regular apps. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's a it's a client library, um, so it can be used, you know, anywhere that you <laughs> might have a client. Um, it, it's just JavaScript. All right. Um, so you can see uh, Eldo's got a, a question about can Firefly communicate to non-web actions in runtime? Um, Meryl, you want to take that? Yeah. So when we, it's a it, it's it, it's a bit vague as a question. So let me um, answer the way I understand it. If you are building a UI based on React Spectrum and you want to back this UI or some U events in the UI with uh, runtime actions, which is the of Firefly, these actions, but uh, if the action is not web, you cannot reach it from the UI. On the other hand, uh, it doesn't mean that within your own uh, and whole and project Firefly application, you cannot have non-web actions. One of the typical purpose for non-web actions could be, for example, or also in headless scenarios where you do not have a UI to uh, add a security layer to an action which would generate a JWT token using one of our SDK libraries, which token could be used later on by another runtime action, which could talk to uh, any of our APIs. This is a typical use case where you can have a mix between non-web and web actions. All right, Groovy. Thanks, Meryl. Welcome. So let's uh, jump to the that how to develop experience platform maps from scratch. Um, yeah, I mean, this is pretty standard, right, Merrill? Uh, which one, sorry? The how to develop experience platform apps from scratch. Ah, oh, yeah, sorry for that. Uh, I was confused. I thought it was in, in the pod. So to build experience apps from scratch, yes, it's, it's uh, but so you use the CLI, uh, once you have created your Firefly project within the developer console, you use your CLI to bootstrap the application following the, the getting started guide. And if you have the Adobe Experience Platform service uh, attached to your uh, workspace, the workspace you're using to bootstrap your app, then uh, you will be able to integrate uh, with uh, Experience Platform. And we even have an action generator already available that was contributed by one of our integration partners, uh, which goal is to help you integrate with the real-time customer profile API easily. So the generator is bootstrapping a runtime action that is bringing all the boilerplate code and uh, and uh, shows you how to interact with the underlying real-time customer profile API using the corresponding SDK library. 
this is a good way to start building something uh, against platform. We are aware that you have uh, many more uh, APIs available within Adobe Experience Platform, and we are already engaged with uh, some community users who uh, is willing to contribute and bring some further set of APIs within the SDK. So this is a great news, and uh, this SDK should be available. Yeah, and I, I would say that in previous versions, uh, or in previous webinars that we've had, um, we kind of go through a demo that that shows a little bit of this, how you can add the um, this customer profile API, and um, so it shows that if you want to look back at those. And again, those will be up on the events page uh, later today. Okay, so. This is a this is a super common question that we get really pretty frequently is can actions have static IP ranges um, for whatever reason um, number of customers want to uh, lock down on a an IP range um, so Merrill you want to jump in here yeah this is <laughs> this is a common one and unfortunately no we do not share any range. You cannot specify what AP range and a specific runtime action should be. However, if we would have more details about this use case, I'm sure that Florian and his team and also us in the back as the engineering team find a way forward to. Yeah, and uh, as we've got on the slide yeah. here, I mean, the, the, the option of, of setting up a reverse proxy um, and having all the traffic with the runtime routed through it. So you, you be able, have to manage that proxy on your side. It's not there we don't offer you a reverse proxy it's a it's a pretty standard thing for um, somebody to set up um, but that's one way to get around this yeah exactly and and that would work as well like either downstream or upstream so either you want to to whitelist the IP address uh, from from your server or or from runtime so so you know it will um, either way but you have to manage the proxy uh, on your side. Yeah, exactly. All right. Thank you, Dewey. Um, so this is how to get started. Um, and the, you know, the answer is just make sure that you apply to the developer um, preview. I'm assuming that everybody that's here has applied for it because I think that's pretty much where um, I had sent out the uh, invites um, using that list. Um, and then just basically following the uh, the getting started guide. Um, and again, how, the same, how can I create custom apps within the experience cloud? I mean, that's really the, the, the focus of Project Firefly is to enable um, teams to create these um, custom applications uh, for your employees so that anybody that um, is logging into the experience cloud has access to these, these custom apps um, and custom, custom workflows. The question about deploy proce uh, deployment process, managing staging and production environments within a project. Um, Merrill or Dewey, do you guys want to? Yes, definitely. So we, we have here uh, two set of links. The first one is showing you a bit more about the different stages, deployments that you can have when developing locally. So to say between uh, the time you are developing everything on your local machine and deploying everything on your, on your local machine, so uh, both runtime actions and, uh, and UI, until the time you're deploying effectively to both CDN and runtime. And the second link uh, focuses more on the CI CD support that we are. Uh, oh, sorry, I think there is a link mismatch, in fact. The deployment link is not a link. But let's say the first link in that case uh, links to the, uh, or focuses on the CI CD. Actions. When you're bootstrapping your app from the CLI, you can select whether you want to have CI CD support or not. If you select so, you will see that your Bootstrap app will have a .git uh, folder with three sample workflows that will show you how we can support using our, our two GitHub actions that are currently available to perform multiple things on GitHub events, uh, specifically on PR to launch the tests, on merge to deploy to stage, and on release to deploy to production. Uh, there is also a section to the guide which describes that the CLI is the key tool behind the scenes for automation and whether you'd like to use the GitHub Actions or 
you'd like to bring your own CI CD pipeline because you guys might be used to Jenkins or you have something internal, uh, anything you like, then the CLI is really the, the main tool uh, to be used in order to achieve the build and deployment integrated with some secret management. Thank you very much for that. That was great. Welcome. Um, and then a, that was all the pre-submitted questions we had. Um, there's anything else? Got a new update. Um, so we had, you know, only developers that belong to a certain org can be onboarded. Is that correct? Um, is there a license involved? Um, a couple of folks have uh, answered that. Um, yeah, currently developed preview free of charge, and uh, yeah, only developers that belong to an org. So when you when you apply for Project Firefly, we ask you for your IMS org, and um, we certainly we we essentially enable that IMS org um, and anybody that has access to it uh, to use Project Firefly. It makes things um, pretty easy. All right. Um, it looks like those are all the questions. Uh, I don't know, Merrill or Dewey, if you guys have anything else you want to cover. If not, we can, uh, we can close this out. Um, I just see a question from Eldo, who is asking if uh, if it's possible to invoke a web action from a different namespace. And you can you can do that. So you can, for example, from one action call another action that is deployed to a different namespace. So in case you want to have, so to say, an API which is centralized and then multiple uh, different Project Firefly apps using this API, this is something that can be achieved. However, when it comes to share between SPAs, I think that for the time being, the recommendation we have uh, one specific application and code base per Firefly project, say per underlying workspace. The scenario that we are um, supporting right now is really to have one project Firefly application that's built for a specific project or organization and to say cloned into multiple repositories, of course, if you're working with multiple customers and uh, needs to deploy the application for this multiple. Um, Marianne, so anything? Yeah. So um, um, I just read the latest um, question from from Edo, and 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 I think that uh, one thing that that uh, you can do, Edo, uh, based on what you say, is is a um, like a set of common uh, runtime actions, is that you can uh, put them in a share package, um, like share runtime package, and then and then uh, in in multiple SDAs, you just um, kind of invoke those share actions. So either you buy them into um, the individual SPA's um, um, actions and then just invoke them. So that would work um, out of the box. But then would, would you recommend to create a specific project for your five project for these shared actions? Because I think it's, um, it's also related to how you structure the, uh, the relationship between multiple uh, applications, whether they are. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so I guess that both can, can work. So. So the best thing could, could be that you can uh, create uh, like a master um, uh, uh, Firefly app just for the core actions and then uh, use it for others. Exactly, that's what I meant. Thank you, Luis. Yeah. All right, that was great. Um, great questions and uh, super interesting uh, use case there of having a common actions in in one project that are then available for multiple SPAs. All right, um, so we've got quarter before the hour, and um, if there is nothing else, um, we will close out. And I want to thank everybody for joining. And like I said, we'll have this uh, this recording and this deck available um, out on the events page, uh, and I will send a link to that uh, to all of the folks that uh, that registered that RSVP'd. All right, thank you, uh, Rob, um, for presenting today. That was awesome, and um, 
Thanks for sharing your knowledge. And then for uh, Marilyn Dewey, thanks for, for sharing your knowledge as well. You're welcome. And everybody have an awesome Thursday. Take care. Bye, everyone.